While I've previously discussed the Japanese fascination with aircraft carrying submarines, I only briefly touched on the Type AM submarines. These are an oft forgotten topic, greatly overshadowed by their larger than life cousins in the I 400 class. Which is something of a shame, as the Type AM is an interesting design in its own right, and one that actually saw proper combat, which is more than can be said for the I 400. Admittedly, they didn't cover themselves in glory in said combat, but really, did any Japanese ships in 1945 shower themselves in glory? The Type AM submarine, alternatively called the I-13 class, were the smaller of the two submarine aircraft carriers that Japan decided they really quite liked and wanted to build a lot of. Unlike the larger I-400, these submarines could carry only two of the same Seiren seaplanes. This would, as could be expected, make them even less effective in the bomber role than the already inefficient I-400. Though, being smaller submarines, the Type AMs were less wasteful, and most probably less wallowing than their larger cousins. After all, one of the biggest flaws of the I-400 was having a rudder entirely too small for its size. Even if the rudder on the Type AM was the exact same size, the smaller size of the submarine would compensate for that. But enough about that. You're here to know about the Type AM slash I-13, not the I-400. The genesis of this design can be traced back to the same concept of stealthy air raids on the American coast. With the realization of just how many resources would be needed for the I-400s, and the cancellation of most of them as a result, several Type A-2 submarines were taken in for conversion to a similar role, though with a smaller and less costly boat. Though, I suppose, it's better to say all but the first were taken in for conversion, as I-12 would be the sole survivor of the A-2, unmodified. Here, it is prudent to talk about the Type A submarines and why they could be converted like this. Type A submarines were another part of the Japanese doctrine of having submarines work directly with the battle fleet. Larger than average, even by Japanese standards, these were submarines designed as command ships for submarine squadrons. You know destroyer leaders? Think of that, but as a submarine. Type A boats were in large submarines equipped with the ubiquitous hangar for a scout plane, but also headquarters facilities and increased command and control areas, radio rooms and the like. Those in large command facilities necessitated a larger submarine. As such, when Japan was looking for a way to get more bomber-carrying submarines to support the I-400s, it must have seemed a no-brainer to take the incomplete Type A-2 submarines and convert them. I can see the logic, though it still isn't the greatest use of resources. At any rate, Japan would take I-13, I-14, I-15, and I-1 in for conversion. Yes, they changed numbering system midway through, likely because there was an already an I-16 in service. A further three were only assigned yard numbers, before someone with enough sense to look at the idea and go, why are we doing this again? In 1943? And cancelled them. This conversion largely consisted of tearing out the Type A headquarters facilities, using the extra space to expand the seaplane hangar from a one-plane affair to the two-plane one, intended to carry larger planes on top of that. This conversion process marks the easiest way to tell a Type AM from an I-400 other than just the size difference. The resulting hangar was shorter than on an I-400. In addition to replacing the headquarters facilities with the hangar, the Japanese also installed bulges on the subs to counter the increased weight and the need to offset the conning tower. The one thing, basic whole form aside, that they retained in common with I-12, which again was the sole A-2 completed as such, was in their relatively weaker power plant. This had been done on the initial Type A-2 design to speed up construction, though it would end up not doing much in the way of good in that regard. It had a happy coincidence, though, in increasing range, which was helpful for the carrier plans, though it did leave the Type AM slower than their larger cousins. When these submarines were selected for conversion in 1943, it was already arguably a poor idea to spend the resources on them. Nonetheless, Japan would complete two of the class, with a third converted, yet again, to a tanker submarine, in common here with I-402, and left at 90% complete at the end of the war. The two complete submarines were I-13 and I-14, 
with I-15 being the tanker that nearly finished. The only other submarine of the class to get far enough for an actual name, I-1, was 70% complete when she conspired to get sunk by a typhoon in port, somehow, in September 1945, whereupon she would be raised and scrapped along with I-15. As for the two that were completed, well, they had pretty drastically different fates. I-13, laid down in February of 43 and launched in November, went into her service a full year later in December of 1944. While this goes to show just how slow Japanese construction was at this point, it also left her with very little time to see real service. She spent some time working up with her larger cousins, almost got sent on a raid to San Francisco to retaliate for the firebombing of Tokyo, before Admiral Ozawa went, no, that's dumb, and spent most of her remaining time training and being used as a living test target for destroyer ASW training. With a break in March of 1945, when the U.S. fast carriers attacked Kure, I-13 managed to get underway and submerged during this attack, escaping damage as a result. Guess none of those 250 plus planes happened to be carrying depth charges. After this, her service aligns with her sister I-14 and the larger I-400s. First assigned to hit the Panama Canal, then, when that was cancelled, to hit Ulithi and the USN Anchorage there. Where the Type AM sisters differ here is that they were assigned to act as ferries to carry scout aircraft to truck, these planes being intended to scout Ulithi. It was in the course of this mission that I-13 would see the first real taste of combat, submerging during bombing raids aside, of any of Japan's big carrier subs. Unfortunately, as I alluded to earlier, it didn't really end well for her. I-13 would vanish on her way to truck. The Japanese lost contact with her and never regained it. From their perspective, she vanished without a trace, not even a distress call. The likely fate of the submarine, though, is fairly mundane compared to other ships that have vanished without a trace over the years. On July 16, 1945, Avengers from the escort carrier USS Anzio found a submarine on the surface. They proceeded to hammer her before routing a destroyer escort, the USS Lawrence C. Taylor, to a large oil slick. Whereupon, the ship would proceed to sink the submarine, most likely I-13. What was a mystery to the Japanese was, quite probably, a standard anti-submarine warfare attack on the part of the Americans. This would be the only time one of these monster submarines, AM or I-400, would be sunk during the war. Though, I-14 would have her own adventures and come very close to suffering the same fate as her sister. Laid down in May of 1943, launched in March of 1944, and commissioned in March of 1945, I-14 had even more protracted construction than her sister, and even less time in service. For all of that, though, she had an arguably even more exciting career, depending on how one views I-13's adventures in Kure. I'm not going to go into detail on her early service here. Suffice it to say, she did much the same things as her sister, right up to being assigned to the same transport role. Where I-14 differs from I-13 is in having issues with her propeller bearings. This issue would see her confined to port for repairs when I-13 sailed on her ill-fated voyage. In the process of these repairs, she made like I-13 and submerged during an American carrier raid to avoid damage. So I guess one could say she mimics her sister there. Might be why her crew also has a reputation for heavy drinking, apparently. When her repairs were completed, I-14 set out to do her mission. She would prove successful, unlike I-13, though not without adventures. On July 30th, I-14 was caught by destroyers around the Marianas. For no less than 35 hours, she stayed underwater to avoid destroyers prowling about, exhausting her entire air supply and battery life. Luckily for her, I-14 was able to raise her snorkel and recharge her batteries without being spotted, escaping the destroyers at this point. After dodging further submarine chasers around truck on August 3rd, I-14 would succeed in dropping off her crated scout planes. The eagle-eyed among you will note, though, the month and year, August 1945. I-14 would not leave truck again before the war ended. Upon Japan's surrender, she would depart on the surface, flying a flag of surrender until U.S. planes and destroyers came upon her. Taken over by a prize crew, 
I-14 would join the I-400s in being taken into U.S. custody for testing. And, much like the I-400s, she would be sunk after rapid testing to keep her out of Soviet hands. Her wreck would eventually be discovered in 2009, in two pieces, off the coast of Hawaii. I-13, as of yet, has not been discovered, and most likely never will be unless someone decides to go looking for her. I-15 and I-1 were both scrapped, as previously established. While ill-fated as one could expect of late-war Japanese ships, especially submarines, I find the Type AM to be an underappreciated topic. Were they just as much a waste of resources as the I-400s? Just as much of a questionable doctrinal idea? Yeah, definitely. But unlike the I-400s, these submarines saw real combat. Both I-13 and I-14 have interesting cases of dodging the USN. I-14, in particular, embarrassed USN anti-submarine warfare efforts at the end of July 1945, which really speaks to the skill of her crew and commander. Really not bad for what they were, I think. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next video.